Thank you, Lady Hannah. Perhaps now people will not flee at the sight of me. You look just like Elwyn did when he was your age. How did you come to have some of my father's old clothes? Oh, before Elwyn became Archduke, our families would often summer together. He and Rodney were like brothers. These clothes have been in a wardrobe for years, collecting cobwebs along with everything else. Well, I'm very grateful for them. And sorry for depriving you of your memories. Not at all. It's what your father would have wanted. They suit you well. <laughs> thank you, Lady Hannah. Yes, thank you. You've been most kind. No, I should thank you. It may only have been for a short while. But seeing you again took me back to happier times. Fare you well. My lord and lady. And you, Lady Hannah. There was a lot to unpack at the end of the last episode, so I'm going to try as hard as I can to get as much into this one as I can. So I might end up actually speaking over some of the less significant dialogue scenes here. I usually don't like to do that, but I think I have to here. So a lot of people tend to give the Final Fantasy series a lot of crap about not having deeper, interesting characters. And I'd say that was never really true. I mean, if you go back to like the early games, like Final Fantasy 1 or something like that, sure, okay. But like from, say, 7 onwards, the characters tended to get more complex. Better than most video game series, I would say. And here is a perfect example. You have the character of Clive, who was already struggling with a lot of feelings of guilt over not being able to protect his brother. And then falling down a hole of despair as he realizes that the monster that he believes killed his brother and him are one and the same. So he's basically distraught and he doesn't know what to do with himself. But he's only going about things because he's being encouraged to continue on by Sid and being reunited with Jill. But now here he is sitting in the home of one of the knights that used to work for his father. A man who Clive had killed. And he can't reveal that. But here's this woman whose husband he killed. And she's acting so grateful to him because she doesn't understand what happened. And he's got to hide it. He can't go talking about everything. It, it's just eating him up inside. Y you? Those are Elwins. By the flames. You're his firstborn. Clive Rosfield. You're mistaken. Oh, you can't fool me, my lord. You're the very image of your father. And that would be true even if you weren't wearing his clothes. The self-same garments Hannah was keeping for you, if I'm not mistaken. She always swore that she would never part with them until the day Elwyn's sons returned. And now that day has come. <laughs> Why, you'll be able to take your bearers back as well. My bearers? Forgive me, Master Mayor. I was a child when last I came to Eastpool. I didn't recognize you. Oh, I'd be surprised if you recognized anything at all. Much has changed since Rosaria fell to the Empire. Not least for the bearers who once served her noble families. When the Iron Blood sacked Rosalith 13 years back, Many who lost their masters fled here, in search of sanctuary. And never returned. Aye. The plan was to send them home once we'd won back the capital. 
But then the Imperials arrived. Rosaria became a province of San Brek. The duchy was dissolved and they no longer had any home to return to. Back in your father's day, any bearer who lost their master became a ward of the duchy. We'd hand them over to the sheriffs and they'd be assigned a new position. But when we saw how the Empire treated their branded, we knew that wasn't an option. So they've been here ever since. And now you want to give them to me? They're yours by right, Lord Rosfield. Bequeathed you by your late father. And they'd be better off serving you than hiding here. Indeed, many of them used to serve your house and still consider the Rosfields their masters. I'm no one's master. Not anymore. They wouldn't be safe with me. I understand. You'll forgive an old man his fanciful notions. Been daydreaming for too long. But still, I would ask a favor of you. A small mercy. If it is within my power. One of the bearers is an elderly fellow who still swears absolute loyalty to Archduke Elwyn. I don't ask that you take him into your service. Only that you meet with him. Let him see that Elwyn's son still lives, and that he's as fine a man as his father ever was. It would be my honor. Thank you, my lord. He sits by the well most days, watching the people go about their business. If you could show him your face, I would be most grateful. Find a man as my father. You're not so very different, you know. Especially dressed like that. Come on, let's go and meet that bearer. I would say that it's probably Jill's presence, which is something that is motivating Clive to continue on. He doesn't believe that his brother is still alive, and he's still being faced time and time again with the things that he had done, the sort of crimes that he had commit. Now, the two of them do seem to have quite a bit in common because while they were both they're both dominant and they were both enslaved for a period of years they were both forced to kill at the bidding of other people and basically they've both been through quite a bit of hell in the years since the invasion he's not here well I can't leave without meeting him I've let the mayor down once already it would be cruel to disappoint him again. All right, let's ask around. Someone must have seen him. But their connection that they have dates back quite a bit before. Now, I was right in saying that um, Jill was kind of a, like, a political hostage, where her family was running in a different country, and Rosaria was at war, but the war ended, and Jill was taken as a hostage for the sake of maintaining the peace. Now, despite that, she was not, at least by the Archduke, treated poorly. Now, his wife, on the other hand, not quite sure, but I can't imagine she was treated well. But despite that fact that she was a hostage, she was treated like a member of the family, and she had a strong connection with both Clive and Joshua. And you could see during the opening uh, scenes, when they were still at the castle, that there was some stronger feelings between Clive and Jill. There was definitely a scene like when he, when Clive was going to leave on his first mission, Jill was concerned that he was going to go off and die, that something was going to happen to him. So she's obviously concerned. She jumps down and she says she's going to pray for him and she starts crying. And there was this moment where he's looking at her, thinking like, I should comfort her, I should do something to put her at ease but he doesn't know how to he's sort of reserved with his feelings now there is a, a bit of an awkward age difference for them she, uh, I would say that she let's say she was 15 and he was like 17 or something like that now it's not a significant difference when they're in their 20s but when you're a teenager you know that's you get some weird questions there 
But he's standing next to her, and he's not sure how he should go about this. If he should place his hand on her back, which looked like what he was trying to do, and just comfort her for a second. And he doesn't do it. He just stands there and then says he's going to bed. And it nothing's happening there, but it does give the impression that, yes, she obviously has a connection to him, whether it's a sort of a sisterly feeling, a familiar feeling, or something romantic. There's something there. And he has feelings for her, too, but he doesn't know how to express it. Now, fast forward 13 years, and they're both adults. They've been separated for so long, each one probably believes the other is dead. And then they come together, and she says he saved her, but, like, it's questionable. <laughs> but she, they're in the barn together, and she knows how much pain he has gone through, what he's experienced, and she's experienced something similar. And... That could potentially lead to like a greater connection between the two of them. And she basically, she leans forward and says, like, you came back to me. And she's kind of uh, leaning in like she wants him to kiss her, and he doesn't. Because when he looks at her, and this is an argument for why um, graphics can matter in games like this, especially when it comes to storytelling, because body language and little subtle details can be um, more important and expressed better. He looks at her, and you see the character model of her as a child. So it just tells you that in Clive's mind, she is still the young girl that he remembers before everything went to shit. Still the young girl who he struggled to understand how he should interact with. He struggled to understand how he should reveal or show any kind of affection to her. She's still that girl to him, and he's still in the place where he cannot reciprocate her affections. Which led to this really awkward scene, <laughs> as she's sitting there waiting, waiting for him to kiss her, and he doesn't. And she just pauses there for a few seconds, and then suddenly, like, like the awkwardness of it sets in, and then she pulls back. Obviously that she's going to be the love interest in this story. And I wonder how long it's going to take for anything to sort of um, develop from this. But, I mean, they're not there yet. <laughs> Let's listen to the rest of the scene. Ah, so that's how it is. Well then, if you're acting under orders of the mayor, you're on a bound to help me find him. He's been losing what little sense he had left of late, saying the sheriffs are coming to collect him and that he needs to go back to the castle. I was supposed to watch over him, keep him out of trouble. But if he's walked out on us, there's not a lot I can do. Understood. You keep searching here, we'll look for him outside. Thank you. I'm in your debt. I hope he hasn't wandered into trouble. This is an interesting and morally gray area that we've wandered into. Now, we've wandered through an area in Rosaria where bearers are treated significantly better than they are in other parts of Rosaria or in the Empire. He wasn't my brother, was he? No, he wasn't your brother. That kind of shit. Bearers are usually treated as being subhuman. Now, in this case, they're still treated seemingly as slaves. They aren't really given freedom, but they are definitely treated better than they are in other places. And they were kept here for the sake of protecting them. Not forced to leave and not given over to the Empire or anything like that. Because of how poorly they'd be treated there. But Clive returns and they're like, you'll be able to take your bearers back. And he's like, uh, uh, he's like at a loss for that. Like, you, like, why would I do that? Like, I don't, I don't own them. I don't anything like that. But this guy's like the mayor is going and saying... Like, listen, they're better off being owned by you than being owned by the Empire. And they're better off being owned by you than even being free. Because at the very least, you'll protect them. You'll treat them better. That kind of thing. Which is a kind of a fucked up position to be in. Especially given that, like, you can see the tattoo on Clive's face. He was a slave himself. He understands what it's like to be in their position. And, like, uh, strangely enough, the mayor doesn't acknowledge it. I mean, the tattoo is unavoidable. He definitely saw it. 
But here we are going and trying to find this one bearer who has an absolute loyalty to the Archduke. There's someone over there. It might be him. We should hurry. Company. We can't lead them to the old man. They need to die. Agreed. So this is an interesting case. We're here to rescue a bearer who is said to be a loyalist to the old Archduke, somebody who was his slave master. I wonder how that really works. I, I, I don't really know a whole hell of a lot of human psychology, but it does seem to be a case that people, like even, even somebody who's a slave may end up having a certain degree of appreciation for whoever enslaved them. And it is said that the bearers in Rosaria were treated better than everywhere else. So, like, even though he was a slave, I guess... I don't know. I don't want to get too far into this. <laughs> but we're just here to sort of show that Clive Rossfield is still alive. and Maybe that will give this person who is still loyal to the dead Archduke something of a, a bit of hope in his life. Are you alright, my friend? Come on. Let's go home. Your Grace, you came for me. I waited for you so long, but you finally came. I'm not who you think. Clive. <sighs> yes. Pray forgive my long delay. It's nothing, Your Grace. I prayed to the Founder that you would come, and at long last, he answered. Will we be returning to the castle, then? There is still a place for me in the kitchens? No, my friend. We will not be returning to the castle, not yet. I'm on a very important expedition, one which may take some time. Could you... Wait for me in Eastpool. Until my journey is complete. I will come back for you then. I promise. Of course, Your Grace. For you, I would gladly wait until my dying day. Thank you, both of you. You've been most kind. The memory of serving the late Archduke was as one light in the darkness, and now that light burns a little more brightly. It's nothing but a fantasy, of course, but it's better than the truth of the matter. A damn sight better. The blight is on our doorstep. Our harvests are failing. The people are leaving in droves. If it weren't for Lady Hannah selling half her worldly goods to provide for the few of us who stay behind, we would long since have starved. We want to keep the bearers safe here, we really do. But unless a miracle happens, we won't be able to spare a crust of bread to share between them soon enough. Is it really that bad? So bad, I even petitioned the Imperial Garrison to take them. But when they found out where they'd come from, they damn near spat in our faces. Ducal dogs, they called them. Enemies of the Empire. I know a man named Sid, who would gladly give a home to any bearer in need of one. Leave this with me. As soon as I return from Phoenix Gate, I'll speak with him. Thank you, my lord. Will you be passing through Eastpool on your way back? I should very much like to speak with you again, if you have the time, regarding the future of the village, and what might be done for Lady Hannah. After all, she's done for us. Yes, of course. I'll be back anon. Fare you well, my lord, my lady. 
I wish you a safe journey. Even that little scene right there with the elderly bearer tells you a lot about Clive's state of mind and how Jill can help him along in this journey. See, the, the old bearer says, like, you're, you're taking me back, right? You're taking me to the castle. And Clive is like, I'm not who you think I am. He, like, he doesn't want any part of this. He doesn't want any bearers. He doesn't want that on his conscience. He doesn't want people to know who he is. And Jill just, like, says his name. Clive, like she's saying, you're going about this wrong. And it doesn't matter what your moral compass says about this. It doesn't matter whether you want to take the bearers back or not. Just by acknowledging who you are and saying what you need to say, you are putting this old man's mind at ease. Even if you don't like it, it's just a couple of words and it will make him feel better.